So, however you have joined us this morning, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. Our worship begins with confession and forgiveness as it is printed in your worship folder and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant, renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. Our gathering hymn is number 661. Number 661. I love to tell the story. Grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all.
Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, <clears throat> our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is written in the Old Testament book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of God. <clears throat> now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Word of God, word of life. <laughs> the second reading is written in the New, book, New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 29 through 31. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the word, world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Word of God, word of life. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. You girls can just stay right here. You can stay on your feet. On your feet. Everybody on your feet. We're going to play a game, follow the leader. Do you know how to play that? Do you know the song like we're following the leader, the leader? Oh, really? Is it that old? Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. But we're going to play follow the leader. So you follow me wherever I may go. Girls, girls, come here. Come here, follow me. Come here. No, 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 no. Yeah, come on. Shh. No, no, stay with me. Come on. No, no, come back. Okay, okay, ready? Kelsey, come back. Stay Let's with make, me. Follow me. Let's make funny faces at her. Follow ready? me, Can you Greg. Make a funny face? Go. Follow me. Oh, ooh, that's, that's a good one. That's the wrong way. That's a good way. one. Here, Greg, make a funny face at her. You're mm. going the wrong. Nee, 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 She's nee, leading nee, 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 nee. you the wrong come way. Follow me. Come on. Come on. Follow. <laughs> <laughs> You're too good. <laughs> Come on back. Come on back. Don't stay with her. She's the bad one. Come on back. <laughs> See what happened there? You were supposed to follow me, but she looked so inviting, and she had such a nice little quiet voice, and she drew you away from me. That's what happens sometimes with Jesus, too. Jesus calls us to follow him, right? You can have a seat. Jesus calls us to follow him, but then sometimes in the world there are things that are, seem like so much fun and so much better that we leave Jesus and we go follow those things. Like sometimes we're mean to people. Sometimes we say things and talk about people just because at the moment it seems like fun. Sometimes it seems like we just don't want to obey our teachers or our moms and our dads, and so we go the wrong way and we don't follow Jesus. 
Sometimes on Sunday morning, it just seems like a better idea to stay in bed than come to church. And yet Jesus says, come, follow me. And that's what we're called to do. Follow Jesus no matter what the world says or people say is the right thing to do. We always follow Jesus, right? So the next time that mean Annette tries to call you away, you just say, no, I'm going to follow Maureen. I'm not Jesus, though, right? <laughs> Don't ever say that. So please pray with me. Fold your hands, and I invite the congregation to join us also. Dear Jesus, help us to always follow you, not the ways of the world. Amen. Good job. Um, are you going to go to Kids Zone? It's yeah. Okay. You can follow Danielle, and she'll take you to Kids Zone. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, free us to follow in your footsteps so that nothing will hold us back from answering your call. We pray this in your name. Amen. Do we have any fishermen or fisherwoman here today or listening? Anyone? Is it, don't, anyone want to? Say that, yes, I'm a fisherman or a fisherwoman. Okay, I see kind of a few hands are going up there. Okay. Well, if you like to fish, you have plenty of company. The Ohio DNR Wildlife Division normally sells over three quarter of a million fishing licenses every year. Now that's not surprising considering Ohio is a state much better than others for fishing. One survey listed Seneca Lake, Alum Creek, the Ohio River, and Lake Erie as the best places in Ohio for fishing. Well, how about you? Do you fish? Now, of course, not everyone has the same passion about fishing, but I'm guessing that everyone here or listening today falls into one of the following categories. First of all, there are what we would call hardcore the hardcore fishermen and fisherwomen. And by this, I mean you're the kind of person who will accept every opportunity to go fishing. These are the ones who have a bumper sticker that says, I'd rather be fishing. Does that describe you? Okay, um, these don't, maybe not everyone obviously consider themselves hardcore, uh, but do take fishing seriously. Uh, this might include having a boat to go fishing, going fishing at least uh, half a dozen times during the year, or maybe go on at least one fishing trip during the year, maybe northern Michigan, or maybe off to Minnesota even. Does that describe you? 
Okay, um, next category I'm going to call the casual fisherman or fisherwoman. Maybe it's been a long time since you've gone fishing, but it's something that you've done. You have a fishing pole and a tackle box, but it rarely gets used. It sits there in the corner of the garage. Or maybe you've taken your son or daughter or a grandson or granddaughter fishing just as a parent or a grandparent child bonding thing to do. So this may be the kind of fisherman or woman that you are. Okay, um, here's one more category. Your definition of fishing is going out to Red Lobster and choosing the fresh catch of the day as your menu choice. Okay, anyone fit into that category? Yeah, okay. As you can see, there are many different levels of passion when it comes to fishing. But the next questions are directed to those who would consider themselves a member of the first two groups that I identified, the hardcore and the serious fishermen and fisherwomen. Let me ask you this. When having conversations with your fishing friends about fishing, have you ever heard one of your friends tell a less than believable story about the one that got away? How about this? Have you, ever, have you ever told a less than believable story about the one that got away? Anyone brave enough to admit that? <laughs> Fish stories. You got to love them. What brings all this talk about fishing to mind this morning, of course, is our gospel text. With Jesus' call to four fishermen who he says he will make into fishers of people. So let's take a few minutes this morning to consider this whole issue of fishing and what that phrase that Jesus uses, I will make you fish for people, might mean for us. Now, I have to admit, I'm not much of a fisherman myself. As someone who grew up in Minnesota, a land of 15,000 lakes, and with one of those lakes a few blocks from my house and a sometimes fish-laden creek flowing from that lake about 100 yards behind my house, you'd think that maybe I had done more fishing in my life than I did. And I must say that I did some, but I never really took it too seriously. But one does not have to be a serious fisherman to have a clear understanding about some of the basics of fishing. For example, you cannot catch any fish if there are none to be caught. Makes sense, doesn't it? And that is the excuse many folks use for not being fishers of people. They say they do not know anyone who is not already caught. And here we're referring to the fact that we live in a heavily churched society. In most any community, there are churches in most neighborhoods and on many streets and corners. And one of the things I've noticed about Fremont is that there are a lot of churches, several Catholic churches, um, and we have several Lutheran churches here in Fremont that are associated with Lyft. We have United Church of Christ, we have the Presbyterian Church, and then, of course, we have the non-denominational churches like Grace Community and several other large non-denominational churches. You might think that the last thing that Fremont needs is another church, but the fact remains that about half the people in most communities are either literally or for all intents and purposes unchurched. They may have their name on a church roll somewhere, but have not attended worship in a long time, other than perhaps for a wedding or a funeral. I suppose the analogy might be that these are some fish who have jumped out of the boat and need to be caught again. The good news is that there are plenty of fish out there. No need to worry that any attempts at fishing for people on our part will be futile because of the lack of fish. Another basic, it helps to know what the fish are biting. During warmer months, some TV weathercasters even give the best time of the day for anglers to be out on the water. How about the fish that Jesus sends us after? One of the best opportunities is at a moment of transition, perhaps a birth or a death 
a new home, a new job, or an extended period of unemployment. One pastor writes this about the fishermen in his congregation. My members who are dedicated fishermen are ever watchful and sensitive to change. They watch the currents in the water, sniff the air for moisture, aware of changes in weather with regard to high and low barometric pressure, watch the terrain under the boat looking for habitat that can, might contain the fish. And they change. When the circumstances change, they go deeper if they have to, switching lures when light intensity in the water changes or when they're, uh, they're, they are in clear water versus darker water. Good lessons for fishers of people as well. Be sensitive to the changes in people's lives that might make them hungry for a word of good news. Speaking of hunger, that brings to mind another basic of fishing, bait. You have to have something to attract the fish. It might be a flashy lure or some mouthwateringly scrumptious worm. But to expect the fish to just jump into the boat for no reason will rarely work. Successful fishers of people will offer something to attract. One of our former Eastern Conference congregations is Trinity in Monroeville. And one of their strategies for outreach has been to sponsor during Advent what they call a walk to Bethlehem. It has, has been an annual event for a number of years, and it is very impressive. I've, I have attended it. The street in front of the church is blocked off, and they put up a canvas wall painted to look like the bricks of a city wall, creating a courtyard. Within the courtyard are various stations with biblical characters in biblical garb, and each had a script that helped to tell the Christmas story. And you cycle and you walk through, you're walking to these various stations and hearing the Christmas story. And the final stop is a stable with live animals and, of course, a live nativity with a real baby. Visitors conclude their journey by going into the fellowship hall for some cookies and some coffee or hot chocolate. What a wonderful opportunity for someone to say, come and see our journey to Bethlehem. Or better yet, hey, meet me at our journey to Bethlehem event. Or it may be some other event or ministry. Here at Grace, you might say, we need some help on Thursdays to help with soup kitchen. Or we'd love to have you come and join us on the first and third Mondays or the third Wednesday and help us sew and tie some quilts for Lutheran World Relief. Recently, the Alban Institute published a report called Why Some Churches Don't Grow, Factors That Might Motivate Those Not Interested in Growth. And the report concludes with these words. How easy it is for us to forget what draws people to congregations in the first place, namely their hunger for an authentic encounter with God on which one which has a transformative effect on their lives. The congregations in our study were much more intent on maintaining their corporate life than they were on offering transformative experiences for either visitors or long-term members. A basic assumption appeared to be, if we serve our own people well, outsiders will see this and will want to become insiders. Missing completely was any desire to find out about the spiritual needs of outsiders or to see if their congregation had resources to meet those needs. Also missing was any sort of strategy for reaching the unchurched in their area. Somebody want to check the bait box again? One final bit of fishing advice, be patient. No one can be successful at fishing without patience and perseverance. If you give up after a few minutes, a few casts without any bites or nibbles, you will never catch any fish. It's the same with fishing for people. You have to keep on casting, keep on extending the invitation, sometimes adjusting the bait. Give your efforts time to make an impact. Then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. A few sentences from Luther's small catechism come to mind. It's from Luther's explanation to the third article of the Creed, where he says this. I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel 
enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. The Holy Spirit has done that for us, and most certainly will do that with others as well. Follow, you, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people, Jesus said. And Paul, as Paul Harvey once noted, too many Christians are no longer fishers of people, but keepers of the aquarium. <laughs> I think that's an interesting way to put it. Prolific and well-known Christian writer Max Lucado has a wonderful story in one of his books about a boy who went fishing with his dad and his best friend. Heavy rains kept them uh, from doing any fishing for the entire week that they had planned to fish. They got on each other's nerves and ended up nearly, well, not killing each other literally, but you, you get the idea. His moral was that when those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. A word to the wise, or in biblical language, let anyone who has an ear hear. Follow me, says Jesus. Tag along, hang with me. A simple, straightforward invitation, which we can echo. And when we do, it makes all the difference in the world. For all the allure of fancy church buildings, the charm of the world's greatest preacher, who pastors the world's friendliest congregation, they pale in com comparison to the hand of the person who reaches out to their friend, neighbor, or colleague and says, come with me. Statistics are overwhelming. Better than 70% in the response, in response is the response people gave when they asked why they joined a church. 70%. They said that someone had asked them. Someone had invited them. Are you ready to launch out? The word is that there are fish out there, lots of them, lots more than we might suspect. What are we going to do about it? How about, with the help of God, going fishing? We live in an exceedingly mobile society. Nothing is nailed down. Change is a constant. But if times of transition and change are good moments to extend our nets in the name of Jesus, what might we do? How about going fishing? What makes fish want to swim our way? The bait. And how, to do, and how do the fish get a hold of the bait? They get it when we bring it to them, when we are going fishing. But suppose we are not very good at preparing our hook, or heaven forbid, our bait is bad. No problem. The witness of both scripture and history is that God can use some strange bait to get the fishing done. Not knowing how or being afraid of, of, of doing it incorrectly is no excuse to keep us from going fishing. And finally, remember patience. God does not work according to our schedule even in getting fish to respond to our efforts. Stick with the program. Do not, let the discouragement. Do not let discouragement keep you from going fishing. One day long ago, Jesus said to some friends, follow, you, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. They dropped what they were doing and came along. And now Jesus says to 20th century friends, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Our response? How about, okay, Lord, let's do it. We're going fishing. Amen. We'll stand and we'll sing our hymn of the day, number 696.
we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. God, our rock and deliverance, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable among us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its varied ministries. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who proclaims judgment and offers mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and the world. As they lead, may they follow in your way of justice and truth. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who cares for the suffering, care for survivors of assault and sexual abuse, and sustain all who minister to them. Keep safe any who live under the threat of violence, those living in poverty, and any among us who are ill or in pain. And today we especially pray for Becky, Connie, Corey, Dwayne, Donna, Jan, Karen, Mike, Pam, Peggy, Richard, Trenton, and those that we name in our hearts. God of grace, receive our prayer. God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples shared the good news, empower us and this faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. When we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who holds the saints against your tender bosom, we trust you welcome them into your care. Comfort those who grieve, even as we place our hope in your salvation. God of grace, receive our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with one another. You may be seated. I like it. Little by little, you're coming out of the pews again. We're coming out. We will now receive the offer. Offering, would you please take this opportunity to fill out the welcome card, place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
accompaniment will play through one verse of our offertory, and then we will sing the third verse of our offertory hymn. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table that we receive what we seek and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Almighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, for supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see. You may be seated. If there are any who are receiving the prepared elements in the pews, I would invite you to make those elements ready at this time. When you have done so, take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ.
And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Giver of every good gift, Christ's body is our food and we are Christ's body. Raise us to new life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory now and forever. Amen. God, who names you, Christ, who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you, and remain with you always. Amen. We sing our sending hymn number 810. in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.